a few words to wrap up the evening. Um, and perhaps maybe we'll just start with Ugo, our early moment in relation to exhibition. Um, and I think, you know, the notes or the tones on which you connected with it, uh, some of the considerations vis-a-vis -vis also your own work and how that translated. So for example, um, I mean, just to make that question a bit more specific, uh, Ugo's done the sound design for one of the pieces inside called It Is Abandoned, uh, which is basically working with voice and the frequency of the room. Um, and in some ways, his practice might seem quite far from what you hear, but there was an register on which uh, it connected quite viscerally, and I just thought maybe you could say a few words about that. The way it connects to, I mean, I guess the conversation started when we started talking about it, or like when we started discussing what the overall exhibition was. And even though my practice is quite far from what the exhibition in itself is, there was a point in which those different poses, like maybe my practice relates more to noise and loudness, and I found that kind of both reach that kind of subtle areas of perception, you know, of different degrees. And we started working on you know, this abandonment, just working with boys and trying to change the dimension of the boys in space by utilizing a kind of hyper-real approach to being in a room. So all the reverb that you listen in that particular piece, which is number five in this the five this time, <laughs> it's just working with the size of concrete. So the space dictated a bit how the piece would work, even though the piece stems way further. Uh, but yeah, I guess that subtlety of like, or like working with liminal states was the way we connected a lot in. And instead of trying to impose something on what was already there, it was just working with the space and the voice in a way in which that kind of hyper-real approach, then it will be crushed afterwards by making it completely dissolved by, uh, I would say, um, having a kind of very rational approach to what was happening and then dealing with it in order to make it something else by distorting the sense of space. And I think it's a good um, example somehow of, I mean, I feel like I should also mention that uh, the, the script of the piece is written by Alex Keith and it's about a uh, space uh, of teaching, which is also a space of sound uh, with a very specific philosophy of sound, um, um, an ancient Jain philosophy in the space of the Samarvasarna. And in a way, like one of the things that was very important to me, and I think they uh, it, this manifests very differently in the different pieces, but with um, It Is Abandoned, there is a script that is talking about space in a very specific way. Um, a disciple entering into a courtyard and moving towards an inner sanctum. And uh, the script, the narrative of the script kind of gave the cue to, to movement of voice in the space. Uh, and uh, Farah Mullah yeah, also Farah worked, yeah, worked on uh, the sound design uh, with Ugo. Uh, you know, had a sense of also how these three stages of the script manifest uh, and how the space changes its dimensions or its volume. And I think you did, what you added to that was also this flip such that we're not m moving in only, but in fact, if you invoke, if the outer edge is what the two spaces share, the space of the script and the space of the voice, then in fact the voice is moving away, right? And, uh, and so yeah, I think the, there was a way in which um, you all, like both of you and the way you listen to the script was also about being true to the script and then bringing in your own kind of attention to a certain kind of 
um, yeah, subtle register of perception. Um, yeah, so I think that, yeah. <laughs> But I guess together with that, there was this kind of constant communication in between all the constant conversations we were having in relation to traces, spaces, memory, and what happens when instead of utilizing sound as the trace, then what happens when you produce the trace by intervening a space, which is also what motivated, I guess, the interpieces, that because the context is quite clear of how you know, sound actually is a carrier of the context that is presented somehow. The only way I felt I could respond to that was by using or utilizing certain properties to, instead of contextualize the sound, let that kind of context arise like here. Like it's, it's not really that it's about something in particular, but only about working with the space, the space of exhibition as you were with. Yeah, so just to say a few words about the interpieces, there they are the sections between the seven sound pieces in the exhibition, and um, I mean Eunice and I. Uh, I mean Eunice is also how Ugo comes into the project, and we must acknowledge that too. Yeah, she's there. <laughs> she's there. Um, and and you know, you know. We were really up against the clock when we made the show in Berlin, and we were like, oh, but we don't want this to be like this one long, um, you know, back to back sense of um, an audio play, but that these are seven works in the show. For me, this is an exhibition, and even though you hear the content of one piece uh, after the other, and so they seem to be lined up in linear time. Uh, just working with the kind of the physical idea of what an echo is, that they are all in the room at the same time as well. Uh, and so we wanted an interjection that kind of acknowledges the kind of conceptual proposition of um, the space and time of sound as an exhibition, right? So um, this was kind of, we, we wanted an interjection that framed, uh, and at the time that the, interpieces came together in, in conversation, but also somehow telepathically or something. Um, I was also actually uh, writing a bit about the, about the show where, um, you know, the, the question of the exhibition as um, not only one that listens to sights, but, or, or songs, or texts, or textures, but also uh, through taking into account this mythology of what ambisonics is, that you can actually bring the acoustics of one space into the other space, but you can't ignore the space in which you bring that other space into. And so in following that thought through, uh, the exhibition is then also a site that listens to the exhibition itself, right? And, uh, and I think that maybe you want to say a bit more yeah. about what the interpieces do. In yeah, design. I guess that, that was also kind of a motivation to try to work site-specifically, even though everything is site-specific at the end, particularly with sound. And this transportation also carries a kind of property to intervene a space. I guess the overall work does that, but by trying to refrain from the from trying to do something hyper or, or like loaded with kind of a semantical approach, at least in my uh, practice, I try to avoid that. It was rather to try to place the listener as well in relation to what happens in between the inter in, in between the pieces, but also like we acknowledge the fact that this is happening in this space. Because I, again, if you walk around, it's completely different where you're listening from. The question that, you know, Moshimi, you ended on in relation to room and borders, and uh, one of the lines in the description of um, the sound play actually comes from, from Uko, and in a way, you know, um, contemporary exhibitions, contemporary art exhibitions which have sound in them are always trying to separate space so as to keep sound in its place, but sound doesn't stay in its place. And that was one of the kind of more 
I mean, I think on a level of thinking about exhibition and exhibition architecture, this is also why the pieces somehow follow each other. Um, and, and I think yet, and this is uh, Ugo's language, and yet in listening and in listening to spaces, whether it's the field of field recording or, you know, or the train that you're on or the archaeological site, uh, a defined location emerges with no visible boundaries present. And that's, I think, something, again, that um, you brought in. Yeah, I think that's also part of the, like, like the ongoing conversation that we've, had in, that we've been having in relation to, let's say, what, what kind of perimeter is bound to like direct experience of sound, whether it is a fact of echolocation, whether it is a fact of acknowledging you know, your environment, which is all these fields of bioacoustics, echoacoustics, and further from, or like stemming from that, there is also what happens at the, at the very edge of that experience, which is where you start to question really if what you listened actually took place in that specific site or not. But that when you're exposed to a, like, you know, high, high amplitudes or very, very subtle events, you reassess what the boundaries of that space in particular are. You know? I mean, that's why I think after we decided what would happen here, I just thought it would be better to just have something outside instead of inside. Because in a way, it also is happening inside. You know? If you would have listened inside, you would have listened as well, together with what's happening. So it's like a, like a remix. <laughs> On that note, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.